morning, everybody. I'm Julie, and I'm an alcoholic. Y'all have not looked so scary since the very first time I walked in. <sighs> yeah. um, Jerry, thank you so much for asking me to be here today. I am I'm honored and I am humbled. There was definitely a time in my life when nobody asked me to be anywhere. Um, and there definitely wasn't anybody that wanted to hear what I had to say. Um, by the grace of God and through these rooms, um, I'm truly grateful to be here today, y'all. And this is my story from my perspective as it is today. Um, and um, anyways, I was born in 1970 in Anderson, Indiana. I was the second child born to Peter and Jean Jennings. They lost the first one. Um, and we stayed in Anderson for almost two years. And uh, right before we moved, my little brother was born. Um, he was named after my father. The sister that had um, passed away was named after my mother. Um, and I was named after my grandmother. And um, I've got to tell you, from, from as far back as I can remember, even from the stories that I've been told, I was born a nasty two-year-old. And my mom says I stayed that way until I was well into my 30s. Um, <laughs> for as long as I can remember, um, I was filled with fear. Fear of not being good enough. Um, fear that I would never measure up to the sister that wasn't. Fear that um, the brother, the boy, would be loved more than I was. Um, fear of never fitting in and um, just fear of everything. And I displayed that fear in anger and rage. I was the meanest child ever. And if you didn't believe me, I'd show you. Um, I would do whatever it took in order to push you away before you could walk away from me. I would hurt you intentionally before I would give you the opportunity to hurt me. I was hell on my parents. <laughs> we moved around a lot. Uh, my father was in the shoe business, and um, we moved, I guess, about every two years. Born in Indiana, then we came to Georgia. And from Georgia, we moved to Chicago. And from Chicago, we moved to Georgia. And from Georgia, we moved to New Jersey. And from Jersey, we moved back to Georgia. I didn't have a clue how to talk. And I certainly... <laughs> And I certainly didn't fit in, no matter where I went. Um, and I wasn't the only mean kid out there. <laughs> but I certainly made an easy target out of myself. Um, as mean as I was, um, I was especially mean to my little brother. <laughs> he was two years younger than me, and that made him easy to pick on. But I have to tell you this also. As much as we moved around, he was also my best friend because he was the constant friend in my life. When I was 14 years old, I had my very first drink. There was no alcohol in our house growing up. My parents were teetotalers. Um, my father smoked cigarettes up until I was two years old, and I picked one up and put it in my mouth. <laughs> and he put his cigarettes down, and he never picked them up again. And I never saw alcohol in our home. Never. I heard stories that my grandfather was an alcoholic, and I heard stories about him drinking and his escapades, but I never saw that. My um, memories of my grandfather with this big teddy bear of a man that would pull me up into the chair with him and feed me candy. <laughs> but my first drink, I was 14 years old. My um, next-door neighbor, her parents drank, and I'm sure it wasn't her idea. It was probably completely mine. Um, but I convinced her that we should go to her house before we got on the school bus that morning and mix some of her parents' vodka with a strawberry knee-high that I had to take to school the other day. Yes, folks, my first drink was probably before 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't like it. I set out with that first drink not to taste it, 
but to get drunk. I had seen on TV other people get drunk, and they laughed, and they had a good time, and they were the life of the party. And that's what I set out to do. And I was kind of grateful she didn't like it and didn't want any more. <laughs> and so I took that bottle of strawberry knee high vodka on the school bus with me that day, and I drank the entire thing. And I was plastered by the time I got to school. But I tell you what, I couldn't wait to get there. Because for the first time ever, everybody was waiting on me. <laughs> that day, I was the prettiest girl in the school. I was the most well-spoken girl in the school. I had the best sense of humor. I was more popular than any cheerleader in that school. <laughs> It didn't go well after that. <laughs> it didn't take long before I was busted. The police were called. The breathalyzer was failed. And my parents were called to come get me. They were not happy with my popularity that day. Um, I was taken home and, well, I was, I was immediately suspended from school for 10 days. And um, when I got home, the groundings were set out and the different punishments. You will not see your boyfriend. You will clean the bathrooms. You will vacuum the house. Um, you know, and for as long as I can remember, I did not react well to anything. And I really wasn't willing to suffer the consequences of any of my actions. And I would do whatever it took to get out of facing the consequences. I would react and I would manipulate you. I would be mean to you. I would boss you around. I would instill fear in you, whatever I had to do uh, to get my way. And so that day I emptied my parents' medicine cabinet into my mouth and I swallowed. And um, that, was my, that was my first attempt at suicide. And it landed me in the hospital having my stomach pumped. But I tell you what, the way that I reacted to not being willing to deal with the consequences of my actions got me exactly what I wanted that day. It scared my parents to death. I don't remember cleaning the toilets after that. I don't remember vacuuming the house. And I know for a fact I got to see my boyfriend after that. Because it wasn't but a couple months later at 14 years old I was pregnant. <laughs> Whew. That didn't go over well either. <laughs> <laughs> my poor parents, I forgot to tell you all, my daddy was also very active in the church. It's a very religious family. Um, you know, I grew up watching my father participate in church. He was a deacon. He was an usher. He did. Um, I watched him preach from the podium. You know, I was raised in a good home where they instilled morals and values in me. Um, I chose not to live by them. I chose instead to, um, to react to everything and everybody in my life. Um, I did run away and get married. Yes, in Paulding County, you can do that as long as you're pregnant. <laughs> and that lasted for a few months, but it wasn't long before he left. And he was only 15 years old, and he just couldn't handle that. I went back home to live with my parents. And, um, and in December, my first son was born, Stephen Thomas, nine pounds. And, um, you know, as soon as he was born, that child absolutely stole my heart. Um, but even having stolen my heart, that wasn't enough to fix my twisted thinking. And, um, and so I, as soon as the baby was born, I dove right back into, into this disease that had begun. And, you know, all the feelings that I didn't want to feel, the feelings of abandonment, the feelings of not being good enough, um, the feelings of being different, because I had a baby. I drowned all those feelings the only way that I knew how. And every opportunity I got, um, I drank them away. I did not take care of my child. Um, I was not a good daughter to my parents. And I was not um, a sister to my brother. I was so selfish and self-centered. The only thing I was concerned with 
was what Julie needed and getting it when she needed it. Most of the time, that was right now. And that's what I did. Um, my son ended up living with my parents. You know, and I didn't do real well with that either. Although I couldn't take care of him, by God, I didn't want anybody else telling me what I, what I could not do. My daddy doesn't know this. I used to sneak into their house in the middle of the night. And I would go up to his room and I would crawl up under his crib and hold his hand through the crib rails. Because at that point, I wasn't being invited even to go home. <laughs> and they certainly didn't want to hear what I had to say. Did that for a while and, um, and, continued, to, and continued to drink and to be the wild child. And by the time I was 18... Uh, I met a man who was funny and who loved me, and we caused we caused a lot of problems. We really didn't get in a lot of trouble, um, but I married him, and, um, and and I quit I quit doing any outside issues. I did the best that I could to be a mother and a wife, but my thinking was still skewed. I still reacted, and I didn't react well to anything and everything. Um, and he had buttons that could definitely be pushed. And I felt a sense of control and a sense of power when I pushed those buttons. And when he became violent, I could play the victim. Poor pitiful me. Poor pitiful me. It was all him. It's all him. It's not me. And so that marriage didn't last long. Um, we divorced. And um, after that divorce, I, I continued to feed my to feed my disease. And I found that when the alcohol wouldn't work, there were other things that were. You know, as a matter of fact, alcohol wasn't near as bad as my parents had told me it was. <laughs> it made me pretty and funny and all those things. So maybe these other things would too. And so I began to dabble in some outside issues. I found some things that gave me what I thought was power and control. And, I, and there was always alcohol to fall back on. You know, by the time I was finally old enough to drink it, <laughs> it became a little easier to get all of that. I think I was um, 23 years old when I met my youngest son's father. And he was older. He was quite a bit older than I was. He had a job. <laughs> and a car. <laughs> and a place to live. And I found those things very attractive. <laughs> he was stable, and, um, and he was absolutely smitten with me. And that made it easy for me to manipulate him in, in any way, in any way that I wanted to. And, um, and he was okay with me drinking. I was, I was old enough to drink. And so I did. And before too long, I was pregnant again. <laughs> did not see that coming. Um, but he loved me and he wanted to marry me. And I knew I was not in love with him, but I can make this work, right? I can control and I can manipulate and I can make this work. It did not work, y'all. <laughs> Try as hard as we might. Um, he, he definitely was there. He suited up. He showed up. And he was, he was the best father he could be and the best husband he could be. And when that little baby boy was born... That one stole a little piece of my soul. Those boys are the light of my life. Unfortunately, love for those children was not enough to keep me sober or to fix the skewed thinking that I have. And so it got to a point to where my oldest son went back to live with my parents. And um, I had begun, I was still drinking and I had begun relapsing often. Um, and so I decided that being the martyr that I was, I would leave my home, have, have my son's father come back and stay so he wouldn't have to switch schools, so he wouldn't lose his friends, so that he would be where he was familiar with, and I would leave. This disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. It convinced me that I was doing what was best for my children. And the truth is, I am selfish. I am selfish. And in leaving those children, I was able to throw myself into the middle of my disease and focus on nothing else. 
And that's what I did. That's exactly what I did. I um, went from living in a nice middle-class neighborhood, having two vehicles, and having a job as a legal secretary in Buckhead to roam in the streets of Atlanta, willing to do whatever it took, whenever, whenever it was able to be done in order to feed my disease. Um, my, first, my first arrest involved a car going the wrong way down Interstate 575 with all four tires blown out. It continued from there to helicopters and dogs <laughs> chasing after us. <laughs> You know, I was not willing to face the consequences of that. And with it being my first real charge, um, I was able to avoid too many consequences with that. My co-conspirator or whatever took most of the charges, and I was out on bail within three days. And I went straight back to feeding that disease. I didn't take a minute to go home and check on my kids. I didn't take a minute to call my parents and say, I'm sorry my folks in Montana saw me on the news. <laughs> but I'm still alive and I'm okay. I didn't. I went straight back to feeding my disease. Um, I was arrested again on another drug charge. And um, at that time I was fairly lucky too. I only spent two months in Fulton County. Uh, before too long, feeding the disease, nothing but the disease. My life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, revolved on doing whatever it took to change how I felt inside, to try to fill this empty hole in my chest. And that's what I did. And I found myself, um, before too long, headed to prison. Um, it was an 18-month sentence, and... Um, and that first time I went to Pulaski Women's Prison, folks, it was pink. We had roses and gardenias on the yard. We had air conditioning and we had carpeting, and there were not bunk beds except in diagnostics. And there were AA meetings once a week, and there were NA meetings once a week. And for every meeting you went to, you got pick points. It's 50 points a meeting towards getting out early. And by gosh, I went to meetings. I went to some meetings. And I, and I was released, and, um, and this time I did go home. I went home to my parents, and, um, and I stayed for a month. And after a month, the disease was calling to me again. And I told them I was going shopping. I took my little paycheck that my daddy had paid me because I was not employable at a real job. And I never called them to come pick me back up. I went straight back to those streets, and then with, in less than a month, there was no money. I was standing back on that corner willing to do whatever it took to feed this disease. And I took, and I took a look that night, and I realized where I was headed. I was headed right back to that same place that I was. Things were, things were, things, it was a violent place that I was living. I wasn't living, I was surviving. And something just came over me that night. There, there was a church nearby and I went to that church and the doors were locked and I got on my knees on the steps and I said, you know, if there is God out there, that God that my parents believed in, please help me, I can't do this. And within about two hours, he sent to Cobb County's finest, and they picked me up. <laughs> it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> and at first, I argued with them, you've got the wrong person. It's not mine. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. <laughs> and that police officer looked at me, and he said, take a look at those people you are with. He said, every one of them has their back turned right now. They're not even looking at you as you are being put into the back seat of this police car. They don't care about you, and you don't care about yourself. But tonight I'm going to do you a favor, and I'm going to save your life. I didn't look at it that way. <laughs> but I had been given the gift of desperation that night. And as soon as he put me in the back of that police car, a sense of peace came over me. I knew where I was going to get my next meal. 
I knew that there was going to be a roof over my head. And I'd been to jail many times before. I knew what to expect when I got there. And I knew how to keep my head down and be okay. And so I went to jail. And I don't, I don't remember how many months I was there. I don't think it was long um, before I was called into court. So I already, you know, with probation and parole and all that stuff had been waiting on me anyway. So I went to court, and they put us in this little bitty room. And that's about two foot by two foot. And they put two of us in there. And the girl in there with me was in a sheer panic um, over what was going to happen to her. But I still had peace. And I said, you know, honey, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. I know that if God wants your charges to be dropped, your charges will be dropped. And there's nothing you can do about it. And if God wants you to go away, you're going to go away. It's the same for me as it is for you. We have no control here today. And no sooner had I finished speaking to her than the door opened. And my public defender, the free attorney, stuck his head in and said, said, Ma'am, your officer did not show up and your charges have been dismissed. Now, I still had holds on me for probation violation and for violation of parole. And so I was taken to Cherokee County. And in Cherokee County, I was sentenced to another 18-month um, term. But I was okay with that. I'd been to prison before. Remember, they have air conditioning and carpets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not when you're a repeat offender. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> They sent me to Washington that time. They had spiders the size of my cats at home. <laughs> there was no air conditioning. There was no carpet, and there were no flowers on the yard. There were no AA meetings, and there were no NA meetings. But my first day there in the cafeteria, a girl called to me from across the room, and she said, I know you. I know you. And she offered to meet me on the yard that afternoon. I actually knew this girl on the streets. She was one of those people that you meet that's heart is so pure that you can, you can see what a wonderful person she is in spite of the disease that has control of her life. And, um, you know, and as much as we could be friends to each other, we had been friends out there. So I met her on the yard that day, and she brought an AA book with her. And every day, we met on that yard, and, and we had an AA meeting. She told me, it only takes two. We had meetings on that yard. And um, she got out before me, and she wrote to me every day. And she made plans to meet me as soon as I got out. And we did. We went to an AA picnic together. But that's a little after I got out. Back up just a little bit. When I got out, I was sentenced to mandatory substance abuse classes. And I was okay with that because I knew that I had a problem and I certainly didn't know what to do about it. So I went home. My father built me this little apartment on top of the garage, separate from the house. I could smoke cigarettes, which was all I really wanted at that point. Just a place for myself that I could smoke my cigarettes. I promise I'll stay away from the other stuff. Just let me have my cigarettes. And, um, and I stayed up in that little room. My father let me work for him. So I had a job. I reported to the parole board. I reported to um, probation. I did exactly what I had to do, and I went to those meetings. And in those meetings, I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot about this disease. And I learned that if I didn't do something towards recovery, that that disease would grab me, and it would drag me right back down. Um, that I was only sentenced to do three months in those meetings. And I remember my three months was almost up, and I started to panic. And so I went to Dave after the meeting one night, and I said, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do when I leave here? It hadn't, I don't know why. It didn't occur to me to go to AA. <laughs> <laughs> meetings in prison were one thing, but this is the free world, right? Um, and so that's what he told me. He said, Julie, you go to AA meetings. And it was like a light bulb. Okay, so I went home and I told my parents, I've got to go to AA meetings, but I don't know where to find one. And my parents said, Julie, that church you've been a member of for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I hadn't been in like 10 or 15 years. How was I supposed to know? <laughs> they had meetings twice a week. And my first meeting was on a Thursday night at the Winter Circle, which is still my home group today. 
Boy, y'all were scary. I was so terrified. I put on my tough prison bitch persona, my black clothes, black fingernail polish, and black lipstick. And I sat in the back of the room, and I dared y'all to speak to me. And I really think I had most of y'all fooled, except Jerry Beard. <laughs> Every stinking meeting, he would come up to me after the meeting, and he'd say, keep coming back. You keep coming back. Have you got a sponsor yet? Keep coming back. <laughs> you know, when I left um, that last meeting up at the parole office, my parole officer said, don't you ever come back. <laughs> And it was so nice to have somebody ask me to please keep coming back, but I did. I did. I had been beaten to such a point of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And after doing two years in prison, I didn't know any better but to do what you told me to do when you told me to do it. <laughs> and AA was easy. They never asked me to drop, squat, and cough. <laughs> <clears throat> So I kept coming back. <laughs> Only problem was, he kept asking me, have you got a sponsor yet? Have you got a sponsor yet? And so I finally, I finally said I would get a sponsor. We had this lady in our meeting. So have y'all ever met one of those people that when they walk in, it's like the angels sing? Oh. <laughs> that was Patrice. Patrice is the one that I'm going to ask. Because Patrice didn't scare me. Um, Patrice wore a halo, I swear she did. I saw it. Right up until the night that I asked her to be my sponsor, and she looked at me, and she says, Sweetie, I have so many, I just can't take you on, but here's Susie, and she'll sponsor you. <laughs> Boy, if y'all know my sponsor, you know I was too terrified to scream and run. <laughs> and she asked me that night, she said, Are you an alcoholic? And I said, No. <laughs> I don't have a problem with alcohol. Drugs are my problem. I have a problem with drugs. She said, well, I've never smoked the pot, and I don't know where the hood is. But if you want what I've got, and you're willing to do what I did, I'll hold your hand, and I'll show you the way. And that's what she did. And we began working this program. Uh, within six months of the time that I came into this program. My parole officer called me, that lady that told me she never wanted to see me again. She called me and she said, I'm calling to warn you. They've taken out a warrant for your arrest. That charge that was dismissed has been brought back up. Your accomplice has gotten in a lot more trouble. They're going to throw the book at him and therefore, <laughs> it's coming back on you too. That's not fair, y'all. We can't do that. They dismissed it. She said, no. They have. She said, don't come out this weekend. Stay in your room. Keep your head low. And on Monday, you go hire an attorney. I told you I was getting real good at just doing what I was told to do. And that's what I did. And I went back to that same attorney. Because that worked out well for me last time. So I went back to that same attorney. And my parents helped me pay for it. We hired him. And, um, you know, we talked and what have you. And, 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 and we determined that I had to plead guilty. So I went to court. My sponsor offered to come with me. This woman didn't know me at this point, and still she offered to come with me and hold my hands. And I said, no, I, I have to do this myself. My parents went with me and stood behind me, and, um, and I pleaded guilty to the charge. And the judge said, before I accept your plea, do you realize this is your third charge? This carries a mandatory 30-year sentence. And I said, yes, Your Honor, but I am guilty, and I'm trying real hard to practice a program of honesty. And he said, all right, then I will sentence you to seven years on probation, and I will give you a year for time served for what you've done in the program already. And I walked out of there on probation. My God does for me what I cannot do for myself all the time. The miracles. It's a miracle that I'm standing here. And for so long, I did not recognize these miracles. And for so long, I was so busy reacting and living in fear that I couldn't see. This program and my sponsor have opened my eyes. And my life is different today. 
Um, a few months after that, I was up in my little room. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, so I was done smoking cigarettes. I was actually sleeping like normal people do and, um, and getting ready for, you know, getting a good night's sleep for work the next day. But my mother called me. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> I'm in the driveway, and she calls. And she said, I need you to come over here right now. And that scared me. So I jumped up, and I ran down the stairs, across the driveway, through the basement, up the stairs, up the stairs, up the stairs. I opened the door, and there were two police officers standing there. And I didn't even think I reacted. I turned around, and I started back down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother grabbed my sleeve, and she said, Julie, tell them they've made a mistake. They're trying to tell me that your little brother is dead, and that's a mistake. Folks... I had been so wrapped up in my selfishness and self-pity. My brother hadn't even spoken to me in over five years because out of his need to protect himself, he could not bear the pain of watching me any longer. And the night that my little brother committed suicide, his blood alcohol level was .27. And I didn't even know that he had a problem. But I tell you what, God is good because I wasn't in prison and I wasn't roaming the streets and I was at home and I was able to take care of my parents I was able to make sure that they ate I was able to go out and purchase clothes for my little brother to be buried in and I was able I was able to stand up and be accountable I was able to walk with dignity and respect those are things that I threw away in order to feed this disease. Those are things that this program and working with a sponsor gave back to me. And I have found that we go through fires in this program too. But we do the next right thing. When we don't know what that is, I call my sponsor. By God, she doesn't have a problem in the world telling me what to do. <laughs> and she didn't have a problem in the world holding my hand and walking me through it. My sponsor has provided me with things that I've never been able to get before. I spent my entire life going to the hardware store looking for a loaf of bread, making demands of people that they could not fulfill, um, and trying to twist and manipulate people into being who I wanted them to be, where I wanted them to be. My sponsor has taught me to love people for who they are and where they are not for what I need and want out of it. And when I need somebody to hold me and rock me like a baby, she doesn't have a problem putting me in her lap. And all this time I thought I was so mean. I really was just a little child that needed to be held and rocked. This program's been really good to me. Um, I have a full-time job now. That was another miracle. One of the suppliers that my daddy bought from Every time I went in, they would ask me, do you want a real job yet? And I'd say, no. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm helping my daddy. He needs me. He's getting old. He's had a few mishaps. He needs me. And finally, somebody in this program, somebody brutally honest, laughed at me and said, has it ever occurred to you he could retire if he wasn't supporting you? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> so I put several conditions on that job, and believe it or not, God met every one of them and then some. You know, and I don't know exactly how long it was. I'd like to think it was several months, but yeah, my daddy retired. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a real job now. I've been there for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> that is really amazing. Um, and, um, and, I, and I had a relationship in this program for five years. I learned a lot in that relationship. I grew a lot. And I learned how to be a woman of dignity and respect. But I also learned in that relationship that there are still some things that I want that are not what God had intended for me. My time in that relationship was done. Yeah, I left Claw Marks <laughs> for a long time. But I finally decided um, 
that if that wasn't where I was supposed to be, that it was time to move on, and I did. That was painful. It was very painful. But, you know, as soon as I opened my hands and I was willing to let go, God started filling my hands with blessings all over again. I had a part-time job in the fall, and I worked weekends. So I worked my full-time job all week, and on the weekends I worked also. Had, um, out of three months, I was scheduled to work 12 weekends. I had one weekend off. And while I was, and actually I didn't have it off, my sponsor had me busy one day that weekend. <laughs> um, but anyways, so that, that Friday night when I got off work, I took my son out to eat. We're standing in line at the restaurant. I'm getting ready to pay, and my phone starts ringing. My youngest son. I, um, you know, and I don't generally do this, but I told him, just answer the phone, honey. Just answer the phone. <laughs> Mama's trying to handle this. And he answered the phone, and he got so excited. And he said, yes, yes, oh, yes, yeah, okay, click. I'm like, what the heck? He said, Mama, we're going to Netherworld tonight. <laughs> Who does that? Who asks a kid to come to Netherworld? That's in Norcross, y'all. But he was so excited. I had missed out on so much in this kid's life. I just couldn't, I couldn't turn him down, even though it was my, my one weekend off. <laughs> so we met up with a bunch of friends at a meeting house, and we caravaned um, out to Netherworld to Norcross. And when we got there, um, things just kind of kind of worked out. People paired off. People went where they were going to go. One child was too afraid to go into, and my, and my sweet little son volunteered to stand outside with him, which left me standing there looking crazy by myself. Um, it just so happened that there was, a, there was a gentleman there in the group that I had never met before that was going to have to go through by himself, too. So I said, all right, here we go. Let's go. So we went through this haunted house, and um, oh, have you all ever been in another world? <laughs> That's a pretty intense haunted house. I went through most of it like this. Uh, with my face down, I was afraid to look up. And through the whole place, he kept saying, look up, it's so beautiful. Look up, it's so beautiful. And every time I'd look up, I would see monsters. <laughs> but I did also see, like, some rocks and, you know, ooze coming out of the rocks and stuff. I just didn't get it, so I kept putting my head back down. Um, and he was a really nice guy. When we finished that evening, they were going to, everybody else was going on to eat or what have you. And I said, I can't got to meet my sponsor at 7 a.m. Um, and so my son and I, we went home. And we got up the next morning, and we went to meet my sponsor at 7 a.m. And um, by 9 o'clock, that nice gentleman showed up and said, I just wanted to make sure that you made it to work okay and that you guys weren't too tired. And he said, and, you know, if you ever want to, you can call me. And he handed me his business card, and he left. Now, y'all remember, I had not been long out of a very, a very, a relationship that ended very painfully for me. Um, and so uh, I didn't call immediately. I waited two weeks, and I waited. I <laughs> get this, okay? I waited until I was on my way out of town to another state. Because <laughs> that was safe, right? And so we, we talked the entire time, and it was, it was a several hour drive. We talked the whole time. And, um, and at one point, he, he lets me know that he's a stonemason. And I said, now I get it. The haunted house, all the rocks. It was the rocks, you were, the rock work you were looking at. And he said, no, silly. It was your face. I just wanted you to look at it so I could see your face. Guys, y'all write that down because that was it. <laughs> I was done. <laughs> So um, we, we, we began dating, um, and, and by February, on, this was in October, and um, on Valentine's Day he proposed to me. And I found out he had already talked to my youngest son about it, and he had already called my father in Virginia to ask for his blessing also. So I called my sponsor. <laughs> <clears throat> Boy, she was a little hesitant too. And I said, you know... I love him, but I don't want to screw up what I've got in this program. It has to be number one in my life, or I don't have a life. I can't be a wife, and I can't be a mother. And, and, and we discussed it, and, and I said, okay, over a year. I will wait over a year to get married. And she said, all right, let's see you do that. <laughs> <clears throat> And so he and I discussed it, and we agreed. We agreed to wait for it.
14 months. We picked a date out of the air. And um, 14 months later, my family came down from Virginia. My daddy walked me down the aisle. And my mother turned to my sponsor and said, you know, I gave birth to her, but you raised her. And I got married that day. I've got to tell you all, that was the most beautiful wedding ever. I hope you all missed that. <laughs> I am so blessed to have met a man that practiced this program. He makes it number one in his life. And he looks at me in a way that nobody's ever looked at me before. That, that evening, on our way down to Florida for our honeymoon, we were driving through Florida, and um, we went through this one spot. It's late at night. I guess it's Saturday night. Saturday night, 1 o'clock in the morning, and the popo is out in full force and we're watching and I'm looking at this huge full moon shining down on the water and I'm seeing the police lined up on either side of the road and they've got cars pulled over and it just suddenly occurs to me you know our, our book talks about a restoration to sanity and it just suddenly occurred to me this is sanity because they're not going to pull me over I'm not worried about it at 1 o'clock on a Saturday morning. I'm not drunk. I'm not riding dirty. I'm practicing a program of recovery. And I'm working principles in my life every day. Both of my children are a big part of my life now. I forgot to tell y'all they went to AA meetings with me. Some of y'all know my kids. Um, one of the most painful things I had to do in this program was um, learning to enforce consequences of, of people crossing my boundaries. I didn't have any boundaries for a long time. I was one of those people that when I came in, my sponsor said, I don't care what they ask you. You say not until I've talked to my sponsor. <laughs> You've been saying yes to everything for way too long. <laughs> and so that, that's what I did. And my kids came to meetings with me, and they supported me. And my parents even came and saw me get a chip one time. They live in Virginia now. But um, I finally, finally grew some boundaries in this program. And when my youngest son started crossing those boundaries, oh, that was tough to have to enforce the consequences. Um, and so my, son lives in, my youngest son lives in Virginia with my parents now. Oh, and I forgot to tell you all, we face everything and we recover. A couple of years into this, my sponsor said, now when is your probation up? And I said, I don't know. I'm on non-reporting. <laughs> so I don't check in with anybody. I just kind of fly under the radar. They don't mess with me and I don't mess with them. And she said, that's bullshit. <laughs> I said, well, okay, 2011. And she said, uh-uh. I want to know when you get off probation. Gosh. So I started making phone calls, and I had to make a lot of phone calls, which is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> I'm in the system repeatedly, and I had to make a lot of phone calls to find out where I was. And it ended up that three years previously, the judge had filed a petition with the courts to have my probation terminated. <laughs> I'd been flying under the radar. <laughs> because it wasn't even turned on anymore. <laughs> that's what my God does for me. And that's what this program does for me. Today I don't react. Well, sometimes I do, but mostly in my head. I try not to do it out loud anymore. <laughs> um, today I try to respond. And this program and my sponsor have taught me to respond with kindness and tolerance and love taught me to treat people the way that I want to be treated and it's taught me to carry myself as a woman of dignity and respect. This program has done so much for me that I could have never done for myself. But after I got out of prison the second time a friend of mine came and he brought me a card and it said peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and to remain calm in your heart. 
I don't know that I always remain calm in my heart, but I don't run around like my ass is on fire anymore. I walk through it, and most of the time I have to walk through it with my sponsor holding my hand or my husband holding my hand. Those are blessings that this program has given me. And today my heart and my soul are both intact. That empty hole that was inside of me is full to overflowing. Today I am so blessed, and I can recognize it. That the amazing thing. I can recognize it and appreciate it. And today I don't take it for granted. You know, I firmly believe that my higher power brought me to these rooms. And these rooms brought me to my higher power. And he restored my soul. And for that I am grateful. Thank you for letting me share.